Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Why is the church so full of phonies? It is my habit when asked, why is the church? To look for what is often the obvious answer, that the problem is people and not at all exclusive to the church. This is certainly true in this case, that not only is the church full of phonies, but so is the world. The world is full of phonies because the world is full of people, and we people are phonies. One could argue that the astonishing success of various social media outlets is driven by this reality. These all exist to feel, to fill our need to present ourselves to the world as better, happier, more wonderful than we really are. The church, however, has an added impetus to phoniness, as well as a sound reason why phoniness should not ever be found there. The church has become that place where we display just how good we are. We ought to know better. The Bible warns us time and again about this propensity. Jesus describes the scribes and the Pharisees as those who parade their spirituality with all the demure spirit of a carnival barker. And we, because we are Pharisees, thank the Lord that we are not like them. Friends, these rebukes against the Pharisees are not there so that we can feel better about ourselves so we can look down on Pharisees, but so instead that we can see our own inner Pharisee. To apply the wisdom of Paul Washer, he's talking about us. In the church, we want everyone to know not how many followers we have on Instagram, but that God is on our side. And so we have to keep up the illusion of having it all together. Oh, it's true, we do it in our casual clothes, showing our brothers that we're not like those shallow people who care about such things. We do it without being judgy, like those horrible, judgy people over there. You know the ones. But we do it nonetheless. And we are without excuse. For the very door into the church is repentance. Our confession of our brokenness, our sinfulness, our ugliness, our inability, our instability, our fears. The very sign and seal that God is with us is not our success but our acknowledgement of our failure. We come to eat the body that we confess we broke, for we know without it we would starve. We come to drink the blood that we spilled, for we know without it we would die of thirst. We, friends, are not the ones who have it together, but we are the ones who wander off. Our pretending is not merely comically absurd, like the emperor with no clothes, but is the worst affront possible 
to the emperor who has dressed us in the righteousness of his son. Phoniness is not some petty sin that we can laugh about. It is instead an implicit denial of our need for his grace. Does it take courage to shed our phoniness? It does. But it is foolhardy not to. Let us lay aside our attainments, our cheap masquerade masks, and run to our rescuer. As we go through the book of Genesis, and particularly Genesis 2, we do have to remember that there is a kind of uh, reiteration here that in Genesis 1 we have a, a broad, wide angle lens view of the creation and now in chapter 2 we get a little bit more of a close up. It's not a new story of, re of creation or a story of recreation. It's rather a close up view of what had been described broadly earlier. And I mentioned last time as we looked at uh, the seventh day and God resting that there was a, one other thing I wanted to make sure we cover and of course there's going to be more than just one but uh, today I want to get to that other thing that I wanted to cover and you find it here in verse 7. There's a connection with what we talked about last time uh, but something even more important here verse 7 says and the Lord formed excuse me the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being now I've said it before I'll probably say it until I die that that while God is one. While we want to affirm God's simplicity and, and not look at him as a conglomeration of parts, uh, while we remember that whenever we describe his attributes, we're simply looking at different facets of the oneness of God. Uh, at the same time, we have to affirm that if anything separates or distinguishes God from the rest of the uh, reality, it's that God is uncreated and everything else is created by him. So we have in Genesis 1 and to, up to this point in Genesis 2, just a, a uh, epic revelation of the transcendence of God. Just as th that first uh, four words in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, that's uh, a bold affirmation of his independence, his self-existence, his aseity, his I am that I am-ness. And so we should be uh, just blown away and knocked over by the bigness, the greatness, the exaltedness, the transcendence, the holiness of God as it's manifested in this work of creation. But when we come to verse 7, we also have an astonishing, maybe even more so because of what's gone before, but an astonishing revelation of God's imminence, his nearness. I haven't had the courage to go too far along. I think I've got up to chapter four and I haven't worked on it in quite some time, but I've talked some time ago about a book uh, that I want to write, but I'm a little bit nervous about it. The book is called The Unholiness of God. The Unholiness of God. And in writing this book, I'm uh, in no way wanting to disagree by any stretch with anything uh, that my father has said about the holiness of God or anyone else has said about the holiness of God. I'm, I'm a firm believer in it. Uh, but in writing this uh, book, I want to make sure that we are also, again, knocked over by his nearness to us by his imminence. I remind people this way as well. When we look at Moses' encounter uh, with God at the burning bush and Moses uh, says, who shall I say sent me? And uh, the living God says, tell them I am that I am, that this is God's sacred name, uh, Yahweh, uh, which translated means I am that I am, which I would argue is intended to communicate his self-existence. Uh, but I also remind people before Moses asks this question and God answers it, God announces his name prior to that by saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
That's an imminent name. And here we have this imminent moment, and it's right at the moment of the creation of man. God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now, one thing this needs to remind us of is that we're not all that great shakes. Dust we are and dust we shall become. We came from the dust, we return to the dust. If you remove God's grace in our lives, we are nothing but a pile of dust and rebellion. But it's dust that God was willing to touch, that God was willing to mold and to shape, that God was willing to breathe into the breath of life, and he gave man life. You know, just a few days ago, as I'm recording, I published a blog piece at rcsproljr.com, uh, an Ask RC, uh, trying to answer the question, do Calvinists, those who believe in the five points of Calvinism, including the first one, total depravity, do they have too low a view of man? And in that piece, I talked about uh, the reality that we are shattered images, that we are made in God's image, but sin has shattered that image, and so we're part mirror and part crack. Well, that's absolutely true. But you know, it's not just a kind of declaration or a stamp like a signet ring that we uh, bear God's image. It's also true that in this moment at our beginning, we are right in his hands. That even as he molded and shaped Adam, he is about the business of molding and shaping us in and through the lives that he has ordained for us. God is a molder and a shaper. God is a tender and near God who takes us in his hands for our good and for his glory. I can't wait, wait to come back to Genesis chapter 2. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsprouljr.com. And join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.